Well, the account of John chapter 12 that we come to today takes place shortly after the most marvelous event of the last chapter, where Jesus proved his identity as King Messiah and the Son of God by raising Lazarus from the dead with a mighty shout and a voice of command saying, Lazarus, come forth! And the dead man came out of the tomb, hopping perhaps. He's wrapped head and foot like a mummy, maybe shuffling out as he came out of the tomb. And Jesus said, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Once this marvelous miracle happened, there were two responses. As there almost always was, whenever Jesus did any of his incredible, miraculous deeds, there were those who said, you are the Son of God. We trust in you. We want to follow you. We fall down at your feet. We worship you. We repent and follow Jesus. We trust in Jesus. That's one response. And there were also, sadly, those who seemed almost to turn into devils when Jesus did his most wonderful deeds. In fact, I do believe that in the Bible we see a marked spike in demonic activity during the time of Jesus as compared with beforehand and after. Of course, Satan has been, since the fall, the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is at work in the sons of disobedience. He has been that, and man, from Genesis 3, naturally, man has been enslaved to the devil and to his flesh and to the world. Satan has been at work in history. We can see that very, very clearly. And... There was clearly also demonic activity at a high, seemingly, before the flood. Because there were angels who left their place and, at least some theologians believe, mated with humans and had the Nephilim. I don't really know where I stand on what the identity of the Nephilim were. But suffice it to say, they were mighty men, men of renown, and wicked. And the Lord judged the earth. And it seems like Jude uh, is telling us in the New Testament that there were angels that, because they did that, have been locked up from that time until now. They left their place, and the Lord has locked them up until the judgment day. Um, and of course, also, Paul says that idol worship is the worship of demons in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 20. So it's not to say that there has not been demonic activity throughout history. There's plenty of idol worship throughout history. But just in terms of overt demonic possession and satanic hatred of God, it seems to me that that was really at a high during the time of Jesus' ministry. And... Of course, it would be the case, right? Because Christ was waging war against the devil and winning. Satan had already tempted Jesus in the wilderness, and Jesus overcame those temptations. The devil and his minions were doing their best to try and thwart the work of the Son of God in the world. So all of the fury of hell and of the most intense Irrational, blind, reprobate forces of evil. They all came together to do whatever it took to murder Jesus, to rid the earth of him. Very well. So those plans were taking place. We read about that at the end of chapter 11. Let's look at verse uh, 57 of chapter 11. Now the chief priests and the Pharisees had given orders that if anyone knew where he was, that is Jesus, he was to report it so that they might 
sees him. They had heard about his, at least up until this point, <laughs> most wonderful miracle that he had ever done. Of course, his own resurrection being even more wonderful than the raising of Lazarus. But they had heard about it, and their reaction to Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead was, we have to seize him, we have to stop him, we have to kill him. It's better for one man to die than for the whole nation to perish, Caiaphas says. So while those evil plans were taking place, just a week before the death of Jesus, and two miles away from the town of Bethany, six days before Passover, um, we see a most beautiful gathering take place. Mary and Martha and Lazarus wanted to have Thanksgiving dinner. Right? It really was Thanksgiving dinner. They're throwing this party for Jesus because of what he had done for them in raising their brother Lazarus from the dead. They loved him. They wanted to thank him. This is not the first time that we see someone give a Thanksgiving party for Jesus. We see it in uh, Matthew chapter 9 when Jesus calls Levi out of the tax collector booth. Levi is so grateful to Jesus for doing that. He invites all of his tax collector friends and all of the sinners with which he associated to come and have a party. And he invites Jesus to come to it out of gratefulness. That's what they're doing. This is an act of worship. Have you ever had a meal at your house that you prepared for someone and it was really important for you that you honor your guest. Imagine how this family felt when the one who had so powerfully and vividly proven himself as the king of the universe, as the one who has power over death, they must have sent a messenger to him and said, will you come to dinner? Mary and Martha, they want to make a dinner for you just to say thank you. How much they wanted to honor this king as he's coming over to their house. I'm just saying, if I was them, I would want to make sure that I had some top quality falafel and tilapia prepared. I would hire Tim Almy to smoke it on his smoker and Tiffany would bake something for Jesus, right? For sure, Lazarus and his sisters must have felt that times a thousand. And so they prepared a meal and Jesus arrived. He arrived at their house. What a wonderful reception it must have been. Martha doing what she always did. Let's look at it there. Verse 2. So they made him a supper there and Martha was serving it's what we see about her. It's how the Bible describes her. There was, of course, the time when they were having a meal for Jesus and Martha was serving and Mary was sitting at Jesus' feet and Martha said, Lord, tell my sister to come help me. And Jesus said, Martha, Martha, you are worried and concerned about many things, but only one thing is needed. Mary has chosen what is better and it will not be taken away from her. Nevertheless, what we see here is really interesting. Look at what Martha's still doing. She's still doing this. She's serving. It was in her nature to do so. She did not take Jesus' rebuke in that moment as, well, I guess I should never serve ever again. No, 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 no. She did not do that. Just in that moment when it was more appropriate for Mary to be sitting at Jesus' feet and probably for Martha to be sitting at Jesus' feet. That's what she should have been doing. But Martha wants to serve. We see that multiple places in the New Testament. And so she does so. Do you know what the Greek word here is for Martha served? It's the word diakonos. It's where we get the word deacon from. She's serving, serving the tables, bringing out the food, cooking the food. She's doing this 
service for the Lord. And the text also says that Lazarus was reclining at the table with Jesus. So in the first century, when people would have meals together, they didn't sit in chairs like how we have with a table like this. No, no, no. It was more like a pillow. And people would eat on their side like this, right? When Jesus is feeding the 5,000, he makes these groups sit down on the grass and he gives them uh, food, right? He multiplies the loaves and the fishes. And all these 5,000 men, not including women and children, they're eating. And I made the argument as we preach that from John 6 here, I made the argument that this is actually the fulfillment of Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me what? Lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will not fear, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You have prepared a table before me in the presence of my enemies. So what is happening here? As Jesus is feeding the 5,000, what are they doing? They're lying down in green pastures, and they're eating the food that Jesus has prepared. He's prepared a table before them. All right. So in the first century, this is what's happening. This is how people would eat. They would eat reclining. Just a few days before. Here's Lazarus we see. He's reclining with Jesus, laying there, eating the food. Just a few days before, he had been laying somewhere else, wasn't he? He was laying on a slab, rotting. His corpse was rotting. Rigor mortis had already passed. His gross bodily fluids are welling up on his backside. He stinketh. And then the voice of Jesus calls out. And all of his blood starts flowing again. His heart begins beating. His lungs are filled with air. His eyes open. He's alive. Christ, by the his almighty word. He's the same God who says, let there be light. And there was light. This same God says, Lazarus, come out. And life enters into the dead man. And all of his molecules and cells, like better, totally better. Do you like that sound effect? <laughs> totally better. He's in perfect health, he, he, doesn't, he doesn't come out like he died of some sickness, you know. Some, some 33 AD COVID or something. He died of some sickness, right? We don't know what it is. His sickness is gone. His death is gone. He's alive. He's alive. And he's there sitting with Jesus, laying, reclining. He's reclining, he's relaxing. The pangs of death are no longer ensnaring him. It's so wonderful. What a remarkable picture is here painted for us. Here's Martha serving. Here's Lazarus eating. You can almost imagine, I know it's the white part of the text, but laughing and talking and Smiling, talking with Jesus about stuff. Where's Mary, though? Mary's somewhere. She appears in the next verses. Look at verse 3. Mary then took a pound of very costly perfume of pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. What an act of love Mary shows to Jesus here. She is so grateful for what he had done for her and for her family that she takes the very best thing that she owns. This is the very best thing that she owns. All right. How do I know that? Because as we're going to see... Judas says it's worth 
300 days wages. 300 days. So how many days are in a year? 365. Let's adjust this for inflation in the year 2024. 300 days. Let's say what's the average that someone might make in a year in America today. Let's just even say $50,000. Let's say $50,000, right? $50,000. So minus 65 days. Let, let's say $40,000. A $40,000 bottle of perfume? Really? Does anyone here own a... You don't have to raise your hand. I don't want somebody to come in and rob you. All right? Uh, a $40,000 bottle of perfume. This is what, Mary, this is like a family heirloom. Okay? Passed down. Generation to generation. The most, the most expensive thing that her family has. She takes out the best perfume in the house. And she anoints him with it. One commentary states, Nard is a very precious ointment. It's actually called Pistic Nard. And it's found in the Himalayas. I was in um, Michigan this week and uh, doing my schoolwork there. And I was in class with a guy that is from Tibet. He's in my classes with me. And I said to him, I am preaching this passage right now and uh, about Mary taking nard. Have you ever heard of nard there? And he said, yeah, we have a different name for it. But yeah, yeah, it's there. It's in the Himalayas. Wow, interesting. It's really interesting. So think about how far away that is. That it's found in India. It's found in the Himalayas. Uh, and in s some parts of Syria. So this had to travel a long distance across continents in order to get to Israel. And there's no freighters. There's no airplanes. This is traveling by like donkey, okay? Or camel is carrying this like root that, the, that produces the precious ointment. This is the reason why it's so expensive. John tells us that she anointed his feet with this nard, wiping them with her long flowing hair. Anointing the head was not an uncommon way of honoring distinguished guests, but Mary had another thought in mind, which the Lord discerned as he reclined at table. She takes this ointment, and she takes her hair, and she wipes his feet with her hair. Think about that, especially you ladies here. Would you ever want to wipe a man's feet with your hair? <laughs> think, think about it. And especially then, like, it's not like the disciples or Jesus, is, or they're not walking on pavement. They're walking in dirt and muck all day long. Everywhere they go, he, his feet are dusty feet. Right? They're dusty. And this woman so wants to honor him, she pours this most expensive, most precious ointment on him, wipes his feet with her hair. The woman's hair is her glory. She's saying, mm, any glory that I have, I give it to you, Lord. To you belong all the glory. Everything belongs to you, Lord Jesus. John Gill writes, the pouring of this ointment on Christ was emblematic of his being anointed with the oil of gladness above his fellows, of his having the Holy Spirit, and his gifts and graces without measure. It was a symbol of the gospel, which is like ointment poured forth, and of the sweet savor of the knowledge of Christ, which is diffused throughout the whole world. And this was done by this woman in faith of him as the true Messiah, as the Lord's anointed, as the prophet and priest and king of the church. So Mary wanted to honor Jesus in the best way that she knew how and with the best offering that she could give in thanksgiving to God. This was her oblation to God. 
her solemn and grateful sacrifice to the Lord for what he had done for her. How could she ever repay the Lord for his loving kindness? Of course, she couldn't. None of us can. None of us can. But she gave her best to him. I'm reminded here of Francis Ridley Havergal's old hymn, And I have brought to thee down from my home above, salvation full and free, my pardon and my love. I bring, I bring rich gifts to thee. What hast thou brought to me? Here we see Mary's response to that. Lord, you did this for my brother. You did this for my family. Here's what I shall do for you. We can learn something here in this text about thanksgiving to God. When another woman had anointed Jesus previously, he said of her, She is forgiven much, for she loved much, but he who is forgiven little loves little. Think about how much Mary loved Jesus. She did not withhold anything from him. She showed it by her action here. This should have been something to rejoice over. This act of worship. The home is filled with this fragrance, the fragrance of the ointment on Christ. And the joy of the Lord was shining through Lazarus and through the sisters of Lazarus. But not everybody was happy. There was someone at the gathering who was resentful of Mary as Mary does this act of worship toward Jesus. Look at verses 4 to 8. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, who was intending to betray him... Actually, let's pause here for a second. Judas Iscariot was intending to betray him already. He had not yet even entered into Jerusalem at the triumphal entry. That's going to be the next passage. That's from verse 12 onward. So before Jesus even enters into Jerusalem, Judas already had heard about the Pharisees and the leaders of Israel saying, if you know where he's at, tell us so we can seize him. It's already in his mind. Just goes to show Judas had had this in his mind for a while. We do not know when this started in Judas, but he was dissatisfied with Christ. He wanted to betray Christ. Let's keep going. Verse 5. Why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and given to poor people? Now he said this not because he was concerned about the poor, but because he was a thief. And as he had the money box, he used to pilfer what was put into it. Therefore, Jesus said, let her alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. For you always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. Oh, behold, even here, our inspired text says that Judas was already intended to betray Jesus. Once he had heard that the Pharisees were looking to seize him, he began seeking some opportunity for this. And this beautiful act by Mary only increased Judas's indignation. What should have been a meal filled with great joy was so rudely interrupted by a supposed disciple of Jesus grumbling over the waste of money. Waste of money. All wealth comes from the Lord. It all belongs to him anyway. In Psalm 23, 5, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Isn't that what we see going on here as well? Here is Mary and Martha they prepared this meal. Here's Jesus laying there reclining, and he is in the presence of an enemy who wants to betray him. Judas not only could not comprehend what true devotion and love looked like, or how Jesus deserves to be worshipped like he is here, but he also wanted Mary's ointment to be taken from her and sold for profit. So look at this. Judas 
wants to take the bottle of precious ointment away from Mary. It's not his, it's hers. This could have been taken and sold for profit and given to the poor. He doesn't only want to take it away from her. He wants to take it away from Jesus. Why would you pour this out on Jesus' feet? It should be given to somebody else, like me. He really wanted it to sell and put the money into his bag so that he could pilfer it, so that he could take it. Judas, in essence, desired to steal this money from them and use it for himself. These people who had hosted him in their house many times. In fact, the text indicates in verse 6 that he had stolen from Christ and the other disciples even before this time. You gotta think, think about this. So Jesus and the disciples, they needed money. It's not like the miracle of John 6 was happening all the time. Okay? So when Jesus multiplies the bread and the fish, that happens there. It happens another time when he fed 4,000. And um, those are the accounts of when he does this miraculous multiplication of food. But other than that... They have to go and buy food. We saw that in John 4, didn't we? When the disciples went into town to buy food. Jesus was hungry. He was thirsty. He was waiting at the well. He tells the woman, could you give me a drink from the well? You remember this. So they had a money bag. Where did they get this money from? Where did they get the money from that goes into the money bag? Some believe it was a group of women that sort of supplied their needs at times, and that could be the case. Was there any other time that we can think of when someone brought maybe a, a large amount of money to Jesus? I can think of an, a, a time when that happened. The, the Magi, right? The Magi brought gold and myrrh and spices Frank incense, okay? I think at the very least, it is possible that this is the money which Jesus used in his earthly life and ministry, which was in the money bag. It was perhaps at least in part, part of the money that they used was maybe this money that was given to him as a baby, right? When the Magi gave it to him, I mean, what, what is Frank incense? I mean, that's for a priest. What is myrrh? Well, that's used as a burial spice. What is gold? Gold is a gift for a king. This money was given to Jesus. So, again, that is conjecture, whether this was the exact money that was in the money bag or not. But they had a money bag, and they needed money for them to live on. Jesus and the other disciples. And what Judas would do is help himself to it. Oh, that's a, you know... We are walking a lot. These sandals are kind of getting a little bit ragged. Hey, Judas, are those new sandals you got on there? Man, where'd you get those at? I don't know. Somebody gave them to me. No, 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 no. He took the money. He would take the money that was in the bag for Jesus and all the disciples. He would spend it on himself. It's wicked. It's interesting, too. What this shows us that Jesus was in charge, I mean, sorry, that Judas was in charge of the money bag is this. Did anyone suspect Judas of being a traitor? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Okay. Why did they give Judas the money bag? Think about it. Who is the best disciple that has the, in terms of like money management, who would have been the best person for that? Matthew would have. He's a tax collector. He's an accountant. Matthew is an accountant. Why wouldn't they give the money bag to Matthew? Because Matthew, like, he used to be a traitor. All right? They wouldn't have trusted Matthew. He's a tax collector. He stole from the Jews and he gave to the Romans. Let's not, even though Matthew's real good with numbers, okay, let's give it to Judas. Judas is so respected. He's a trustworthy man. 
And so no, none of the disciples thought that he would be the one to betray Jesus at all. Even later on in the Last Supper, when Jesus says, one of you will betray me, do all the disciples go to Judas and say, it's him? No, they don't. They don't. No one does. They say, is it I, Lord? Am I the one? So here's Judas. He has this money bag. He's so angry at this waste, he, what he would call a waste. And he displays fake piety by claiming that the money could go to the poor. Can you imagine that? He was really a son of perdition, though no one but Jesus knew it. Look how utterly rude Judas is in this moment. In Mary's own house with resurrected Lazarus reclining next to Jesus, Judas has the bitter gall to publicly rebuke the woman for offering her best gift to the Lord. As Mary is on her knees worshiping Jesus, anointing him, wiping his holy feet with her hair, Judas calls, you shouldn't be doing that, Mary. Stop it. What a waste. As if an act of love toward Christ could ever be wasted. I don't want to distract from the main point of this passage, but I will say that this just goes to show how wretchedly deceitful wolves in sheep's clothing can really be. As I said, no one suspected Judas of being a traitor. So, our Lord, knowing all these things, and still having the self-control to not stand up and cry, away from me, you hypocrite. Isn't it amazing that Jesus doesn't stand up and say that right now? You know why he doesn't say that right now? Because he knew that all things had to be fulfilled, that the one who was his supposed friend would betray him and hand him over for 30 pieces of silver. This is the reason why... I don't know how he exhibited such amazing self-control in this moment, knowing, seeing through such hypocrisy by one of his disciples. But what does he say? He defends Mary. Therefore Jesus said, let her alone, so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. For you always have the poor with you. But you do not always have me. Look at Jesus is always looking toward the cross. It is the purpose for which he comes into the world. His mission is to go to Jerusalem and die on the cross as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That is why he came into the world. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. He came to give his life as a ransom for many. And he says here, let her keep this ointment. Don't take it from her. Don't sell it. Let her keep the ointment for the day of my burial. He has it in mind already. You see, before he even enters into Jerusalem, we see it the very next day. Look at verse 12. On the next day, a large crowd who had come to the feast when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him and began to shout, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. This is the very next day. Jesus knows, as he's going to be proclaimed king and ride into Jerusalem in fulfillment of the prophecy in Zechariah and, and Micah and all the prophecies, he knows that he is going in there to die. That's it. He's going to Jerusalem to die. And six days before he dies, he tells Judas... Let her save the rest of this. Whatever she has not poured out on my feet already, let her save it for the day of my burial. Because it is coming. It is coming. What does Jesus have to do in order to not die? 
You know what he has to do in order to not die? Just like don't go into Jerusalem. That's it. Just don't, don't, don't go. Just go back up to Galilee. That's all he has to do. Go back to Nazareth. Continue ministering all your days, healing sick people. That's all you would have to do to not die. But he goes there because that's his purpose for coming into the world. Okay? That is his purpose. His purpose was not to be a good moral teacher, even though he is the best moral teacher. He is the perfect moral teacher. He never lies. No deceit is found in his mouth. But even that, even the moral teachings of Christ, even his explanation of the law and how the law applies, even all the wonderful things that Christ says about how his disciples should live, even that, even that is not his purpose for coming into the world. Christ is not merely a teacher. He is a sacrifice. He is our sacrifice. He comes into the world to be that. He prophesies that this is what's going to happen. Hey, the bottle is open, right? The perfume, the pure nard, the cap is busted off of it now. She had been saving it for the best occasion, this occasion, to anoint Christ. He says, save it. Save the rest of it. Because the day of my burial is fast approaching. And I'm going there. I'm headed toward it. This should make us worship Christ all the more. Because he goes into Jerusalem knowing exactly what is going to happen. This is the reason why. Look, 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 look. We're in John 12 right now. Okay, we're in John 12. We're like about halfway through the Gospel of John. The second half of the Gospel of John is focused on the last week of Jesus' life. The last week. The, like half of the entire Gospel is focused just on one week. Why? Why is that? Why would such a profound focus be on this? Because this is the whole purpose for which he comes into the world. That's the reason why. He goes there for this. Hmm. Now, I don't know whether Mary knew that she was anointing Jesus for his burial or not. Jesus himself knew that she would need the nard as she helped with preparing his body for burial less than a week later. And when Jesus talks about the poor here, look at what he says. Leave her alone that she may keep it for the day of my burial. For you also, or for you always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. Um, the poor will always be here in this world. It is plainly true. Even 2,000 years later, with all of our technological advancements, with all of our GMOs, look at that. Did, did the GMOs get rid of poverty? I know. Genetically modified food, did, did that st stop all poverty? There's no more starving people in the world anymore? No. More than a quarter of the world today is living in desperate poverty. And it's despite all of our advancements, all of our technology, Mm, the vast majority of North Korea is starving to death. It is. There are people in India that are starving. People in Africa that are starving. Starving. The poor will always be with us. But I see another application in this text directed to Judas himself. When Jesus says... The poor will always be with you, but you will not always have me. It's interesting because Jesus tells his disciples, the disciples who are truly disciples, in Matthew 28, Surely I am with you always, 
even to the very end of the world. That's what he says to the disciples, to the end of the age, right? I will always be with you. But when Jesus says to Judas, leave her alone, she's keeping it for the day of my burial, the poor you will always have with you, but you will not always have me. I think that there's an application to Judas himself that he is about to go to the place um, where he would be in absolute poverty, absolutely separated from any benefit or blessing of God forever in hell or in the temporary place of torment waiting hell, awaiting hell. And he would be in a place of thirst and want forever. And he would no longer have the blessing of Christ with him anymore. This was an application to Judas, a false disciple. He looked like a disciple. He looked like it. No one suspected him of being something other than a disciple. He, everybody thought that he was a real disciple, but he was not a disciple. He was not. This is the reason why the Bible tells us to examine ourselves. To see whether we are in the faith. Don't say, uh, I go to church, therefore I'm in the faith. Don't say, well, you know, my parents preached the gospel to me, therefore I'm in the faith. Don't say, well, I was raised as a Christian, therefore I'm in the faith. Look at Judas was as physically close as a person can possibly be to the Lord Jesus Christ. He saw his miracles. He was on the boat with him. Not only that, he even had, was imbued in Matthew 10 with the ability to do miraculous things, to do miracles. He could do them. Jesus sent out the disciples to go and perform miracles, heal the sick, and cast out demons. He was able to do it. But in the end, he's the kind of man who will say to the Lord on the final day, Lord, Lord, didn't I heal the sick and cast out demons and preach the gospel in your name? Didn't I do all these things? And Jesus will say to him and to those who are such as him, Get away from me. I never knew you. God forbid that that would be the case for anybody who is sitting here in this room today. Anybody. You need to make sure that you are in the faith, that you belong to Jesus, that you trust in Christ, that he knows you and you know him. That you know him in this way, this saving way. Do you know him? Do you know him? You may go to a Christian school and not be a Christian. You may do Bible study all the time and not be a Christian. You know who else did Bible study all the time, all the time, who were like the best Bible students, who could quote you any verse of Deuteronomy or any verse of 1 Samuel, or who could quote you those things? Do you know who? The Pharisees could do that. Of course they could. They're Bible experts. Experts. Truly. Greater experts in the content of the word than me. Okay? I mean, just because from like birth, they're memorizing the whole Torah. Memorizing it. They know it like the back of their hand. They know it. Right? I want to know the Bible really well. These people really, really knew the content of the scripture. They knew the content of it. But that content was never applied to their heart. They were filled here and not here. There are 18 inches between life and death. Okay? You can be filled with the Bible here and have nothing of the Bible here. Do you know him? I want you to look at the closing verses and then we'll pray. Verse 9 to 11. 
The large crowd of the Jews then learned that he was there, and they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might also see Lazarus, whom he raised from the dead. But the chief priests planned to put Lazarus to death also, because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and were believing in Jesus. Ha! is all I have to say to that. Ha! Really? Lazarus is like, been there, done that. Like, what, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Take my life? I already died. I know what is awaiting me. Remember, there's this large crowd now. As, as you prepare for when we're going to read about and study the triumphal entry of Christ into Jerusalem. There's this large crowd gathering around Jerusalem for Passover. Travelers from all over. Word had spread all around that Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead. So many people decided to come and crash the party. They wanted not only to see Jesus, but also the man who had been dead, who was now alive again. Of course, who wouldn't want to see him? Who wouldn't want to chat with Lazarus? Just chat with him. So... I have a lot of questions for you, man. What happened like two seconds after you took your final breath? Were the angels there already? Did you have to wait for them? How does it feel to be back? Do you regret it? Do you wish Jesus had just left you up there? I'm sure you do, right? What was it like? Did you hang out with the angels? Did you meet Abraham like the other Lazarus Jesus spoke about? Did you see the other Lazarus who was in Abram, Abram's bosom and who was, was talking to the rich man? Did you meet him too? Was heaven so wonderful? Tell us everything. Tell us everything. I want to meet you. I want to talk with you about these things. What was it? I mean, am I the only one? Wouldn't all of you have all those same kind of questions for Lazarus? I mean, I wonder what Lazarus would have thought about it all <laughs> as well. <laughs> really. But I know one thing. I know that he wasn't bothered in the least by the plot against him. What could the chief priests do that he had not already experienced? What could they do? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. And do you know why the priests wanted Lazarus dead? Because many of the Jews were, quote, going away and were believing in Jesus. Let me just tell you something. If God uses you as an instrument to cause many to go away from dead false belief and to follow Jesus, the world will want you to be dead as well. Okay? That's true. Okay? Because... Satan rules this world. He does not like it when people are being rescued out of his dark kingdom into the kingdom of God's dear son. He does not like it. And they were going away from the stale Pharisaism to life in Christ. And what's really fascinating is that um, as I was studying this passage, some Orthodox traditions believe that after the resurrection of Jesus... Mary and Martha and Lazarus went to France, okay, and moved to a town called Tarascon. <laughs> I, was, uh, I was talking with my professor this last week, my preaching professor at Puritan Reformed Theological Seminary, and I told him that I'm about to be preaching this passage and, and how I had learned about this, that uh, at least there's some historical tradition, fable, that, that Martha and Mary and Lazarus went and moved to Tarascon, France, and that Mary and Martha tamed a dragon, and then the people of France came and killed the dragon and then ate it, right? Uh, and I said, man, I think I'm going to share that with the congregation. And he said, don't. But, <laughs> but, but I'm sharing it with you anyway. It's not biblical, all right? It's not in the Bible, but it, is, but it is tradition, anyway, traditionally, not who cares about what tradition says. We only care about what the Bible says. But suffice it to say, there's at least some theologians who will say that the reason why um, this is recorded in John's gospel 
and not in the other Gospels is because John wrote his Gospel far later than the other Gospels. And the reason why the other Gospel writers did not include this particular story about the raising of Lazarus and the Pharisees wanting to kill Lazarus is because the other Gospel authors wanted to protect Lazarus and his family from those who would seek his life and their lives. And that by the time John was writing his Gospel, it was already later on. It, either they were already gone and dead or they had moved away, or this was no longer an issue for them, which I think makes sense. I think it makes sense. Nevertheless, the forces of evil in this world can never thwart the work of the Lord. The gospel goes forth despite all the forces of evil trying to stop it, despite all the demons of hell, despite Satan himself, he cannot stop the preaching of the gospel and the work of God in the world. And we see that because Christ, Christ our head, Christ our leader, went all the way to the cross for us. And he conquered death. And because that's the case, we need fear death no more. Because Jesus lives, we also shall live. Hallelujah. What a Savior. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you that Jesus went to the cross. We thank you that he knew that that was what was going to happen, and he went anyway. Thank you for this uh, account of the devotion of Mary as she pours out her best for the Lord. Help us to give our best to the Lord. Help us to have this same attitude and not the attitude of Judas, who was so self-centered and so self-focused and who only wanted to serve self. <clears throat> Instead, Mary wanted to serve the Lord out of the gratefulness which was in her for what the Lord had done for her and for her family. Help us to have that attitude, Lord. Help us to to examine ourselves and to make sure that we are really in the faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.